Well, this is gorgeous Terrigal, one of 41 golden beaches dotted along the central coast area. It is a beautiful part of the world, but sadly, Ed, we're not staying here. No, it's terrible, isn't it? Well, it's not terrible because it's adventure. I'm actually going to head on the bike up to a place called Kulnura. It's a little ways that away where a family is running a beautiful farm I'm going to go check out. Wow, that sounds good. And I've got a hankering for oysters and local area knowledge points me in the direction of Mooney Mooney Bridge. Are you serious? I am serious. And if you behave yourself, I'm going to save you a couple. I might do. <laughs> Whether it's fashion or food that you're after, there is so much joy to be found in oysters. And some of the very best in Australia are actually farmed here on the central coast of New South Wales, grown by none other than James Brown. Hello, James. G'day, Joe. How are you? It is so nice to meet you. I have gone past this part of the world a million times in my life and never known that there was a pearl farm here. Oh, well, don't worry, you're not alone. Nobody, even the people that live around here, knew that Broken Bay pearls existed for the longest time. Your own history, third generation pearl farmer. Actually, we stayed in your house in Signet Bay. It was just the most extraordinary trip that we ever had. Other side of the country, but just as exciting. Brilliant. Well, can we, can we go for a little, little, little excursion today? You can show me what you're, you're actually offering people when they come and do the tours. And... Yeah, we'll take you all the way through it. We'll show you exactly how we make these amazing, amazing pearls here on the Central Coast. OK, so... So what sort of oysters are they? Commonly known as an Akoya pearl oyster, but they're native to the New South Wales coast. OK. And here's some of our little babies. Wow, so how old would these be? These guys are coming on to about a year. It takes yeah. about two or three years until they're big enough for us to actually start seeding them. So at this stage, we're just trying to hopefully grow them out without things eating them. Everything wants to eat them at this stage. Really? Yeah. What do you offer people now that you've opened this up as, as tourism here? Well, we're trying to show them the whole industry. So we step them through every stage. So how our little baby shell come out from the hatchery all the way through to seeding, harvesting, and then also how we then grade and you know value our pearls and how they use them to jewellery. So we're really trying to give people the full experience. So this is the nerve centre for Broken Bay Pearling Company, believe it or not. <laughs> From this humble little oyster shed, <laughs> they have built an entirely new industry for New South Wales. Wow. Come in, you can see it all for yourself. Fantastic. Welcome to our <laughs> humble oyster shed. <laughs> but it's where all the magic happens though, isn't it? It's all you need. It's all you need to uh, grow little baby oysters. This is our newest little babies. These are literally just a couple of months old. Wow. So. Hopefully, if we treat them well, within two to three years, they'll be this size, which is when we can start trying to culture a pearl in it. Well, can you talk me through the seeding process then? That's our little donor tissues that then get grafted in to host oysters. And that tissue should actually be able to create a pearl sac and should actually lead to being able to grow a pearl. That's the aim. And then the one little thing that she also puts in with that graft tissue... Yep is one of these little white seeds. Each cultured pearl, every cultured pearl you've ever seen has actually got a little shell bead made out of a Mississippi clam shell. Wow. Yeah. So can you see the... Yes. ..both sides of the crack? We've had one of the elders come down and he's explained it to me that this is basically a list of fish that you could catch here. Oh, wow, look at the size of these. Yeah, they're a little bit bigger, hey? Yeah. So, how old are these? Older than five years now, actually. Okay. But they're ready for harvest, yep. so we seeded these two years ago. So, with a bit of luck, we should be able to open some now and see if we've actually grown a pearl. <gasps> Gorgeous! There you go. Wow, that's a beauty. <laughs> All yours. Look at it, beautiful. Yeah, but it comes out bright. They're really yeah. bright and lustrous. They sure are. Mm. So pearly. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand why people really fall in love with the idea of pearls and wearing pearls because there's just so much love that goes into it. Yeah. And it's just so many people and so many hours and years and effort that's gone into it. I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that once people have met a few mad pearl farmers that they actually... That they really appreciate what they've got. <laughs> oh, that's stunning. 
Can he help? That's it. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Let's head over to the Shell door and we'll actually take you through what we do there. Fantastic. I cannot believe this is your office every day. Come in, Joe. Welcome to the Shell door. The Shell door. I love that. That's very, very funny. Oh, wow. Yeah. Goodness me, I can't get over the difference in the colours. Yeah, it's broad, right, compared to the broom crop. But... Yeah. So this is where we, where once we stop farming, we actually bring people in to sort of show them how we grade and value and then even use the pearls in jewellery. Have you ever thought about creating some amazing pieces that combine both your pearls from Broken Bay Pearls and Signet Bay? Yeah, we, we've actually just started playing around with that. So we feel like it's telling the story of both pearls from both farms and both sides of the country. Well, James, I feel very lucky that you shared it by showing it to us, so thank you. In fact, the whole day has just been so awesome. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. You're more than welcome to come back any time. You've been, you've been great. Don't worry, I will be back, and then you'll be regretting saying that. <laughs> If you head inland from Terrigal and past Mangrove Mountain, which for all you two-wheel enthusiasts is an amazing spot for a weekend ride, you're going to find yourself at a very special sustainable farm run by Tony and Virginia. G'day guys, how are you? Hi, G'day Ed, how are you? Mate, I'm good. I've just had a lovely ride on the bike to get here. It's worth every moment on the road, I tell you, because this is stunning. How long have you been here? Thank you so much. About seven years. Okay. And you've set up Grace Springs to do what exactly? So Grace Springs Farm is a working farm. A real old-fashioned style farm where you had lots going on. And then we also open up our farm for school excursions, farm tours, and it's all about reconnecting families back with where their food comes from, connecting them with animals, um, and, and just educating people. And Education's so good, isn't it? And I tell you what, I, for one, could use a little more education myself. So if you're up for it and got the time, I'd love a tour myself. I'd love to have you. All right, well, I'm you lead the way. <laughs> Who's this beautiful creature? This is our beautiful Guernsey cow, Melody. This girl is just one in a million. All of our Guernsey cows that are milking, we actually milk them here on the farm. I love the animals, but I've got a bit of a hankering for some veggies. I did see you've got a bit of a patch growing up there. You want to show me that as well? Yeah, for sure. Let's go up and have yeah, a look. Yeah, Melody's heading off anyway, so... <laughs> So this head? Rooting beautifully, isn't she? Yeah, really, really good. Very yeah. old. How hot is it, though? Oh, seriously hot. Do you want to have oh, a go? It can't be that hot. Have a go. Can't be that hot, really. So what are we going to do with all of this incredible produce? Well, if you're anything like me, the one thing you always need is another great idea for midweek meals for the family. And I have a brilliant one. How about we go with a Thai Tom Yum style, but instead of doing it as a classic soup, we do it on the barbecue with some chicken instead. So what you'll need is a little bit of galangal. That comes from the garden. And a little bit of turmeric as well. A little bit of ginger, of course, and garlic. Can't live without garlic. Just pop those into a mixer jug, along with a little bit of palm sugar, some sesame oil, and coconut cream. And then we'll give it our first stage of processing. Now, you don't need to worry about getting this completely smooth just yet, because there's actually still a couple of ingredients left to go into the mix. Now, for starters, Tony and Virginia have some beautiful kaffir lime leaves in the garden, so I've grabbed a few of those. This, no, it's not a lemon, it's actually a lime. It's just a fully ripe one, so that'll give us some acidity as well. And, of course, we're going to want some heat. Now, how many chilies do you reckon I can take? One or two? You guessed it. We'll go with one. Trust me, we're nearly done, but there's a couple of ingredients left. I know it's a little bit complicated, but it's really worth it for the flavour. You want some soy sauce? as well as fish sauce. Then one stick of Tony's beautiful looking lemongrass. And finally, shrimp paste. You need the pre-roasted stuff, just a sprinkle, and then we'll puree again. It's not just that it looks pretty, it smells amazing as well. There is, however, one final thing I want to throw in there, believe it or not, and that's just a little bit of the coriander we found in the garden.
Next up, the chicken. Now, before you ask, yes, I'm going to use chicken drumsticks. Why? Because A, they're delicious, and second, they're super cheap, which makes them really budget friendly. What you'll need to do is to grab yourself a small knife and make some cuts around the drumsticks as far in as you can. It's like making little rings. You should get three on each. And what that's going to do is allow the marinade to really penetrate and also it'll make them cook faster too. What we're going to do next is chuck the marinade on top, mix it through really well, and ideally you'd refrigerate it for at least an hour. Or well, if you've got the opportunity, overnight is amazing. Once that's done, then we can start to think about cooking. One of the great things about this particular recipe is that there is actually loads of different ways you can cook it. Now, if you're at home, you could simply bung it straight into a hot oven and it'd need about maybe half an hour or so. But if you're outdoors, I reckon there's nothing better than getting a fire going. It always tastes better. But when you do it out here, you need to cook in two stages. So first off, just browning them lightly over low to moderate coals. And then just transfer them into a camp oven. I'll throw in the rest of that sauce as well. And we'll just let them simmer out. That's going to take maybe 15 minutes. I've got to tell you, on a scale of 1 to 10, this dish is a 38. It smells incredible, and it's really pretty easy to put together, like you saw. Now, if you wanted to, you could, of course, I don't know, grab some rice or some noodles or even just a chunk of bread for the kids. But for me, I want to keep it nice and light. So just some more fresh veggies straight from Tony and Virginia's garden. Scatter them on a platter. Put the chicken on top and then finish with a little bit more of your marinade. That really does look amazing. I think we have done justice to the chicken and the vegetables here at Grace Springs. It's a great place, but it's not the only brilliant food adventure you can have on the Central Coast. There's loads to see. So strap in, because later in the show, we've got even more for you. The recipe road trip continues. Our Central Coast recipe road trip has taken us to farms both on land and water, but I've saved somewhere special for our final stop. Oh, Ed, I used to come here all the time with my nana. This used to be the fragrant garden. Now it is the most amazing gin distillery. It's really beautiful as well. Check it out. It's called Distillery Botanica, run by Philip Moore. And his inspiration and botanicals come straight from the garden itself. Today we're distilling juniper, okay. which is the main thing in gin. And when we do it, we have to go through the cuts. So. What we're trying to determine here is where the nice stuff starts and where the nasty stuff finishes. You yeah. would have been at the start of the craze of, of yeah. gin distillery. I mean, you were... Well, I was uh, probably number 15, and now there'd be well over 200 distilleries in Australia. Wow. You've got a whole bunch mm. of the different sorts of aromatics that you're putting in. Yeah. Uh, what do you got? You've got macadamias and juniper berries, uh, pink peppercorns, pink corn, yep. and some mm. flowers. What's different about the process of using different flavours, and how do you blend them? Well. It's, it's a very, very refined process. Like, I have got in the Moore's gin, our most popular gin, I've got the pink peppercorn. It's there in parts per billion. Not million, but billion. A lot of people are using Australian natives, but you've got to be very careful with them because some of them have that sort of toilet cleaner character about them, and so you, you've got to make sure that you don't... That's not a good thing. <laughs> <It's not laughs> yeah. but, but there are Australian natives. Like, the ones I've used in the Moore's, macadamia, uh, the wild lime and the Illawarra plum, mm. they, they all, you can sort of relate to the flavours of those. But if you get things that have, you know, maybe sort of gum tree flavours or tea tree oil flavours in them, that, that is not a good thing mm. in a gin. Yeah. It's absolutely fascinating. Congratulations on what you've built right. up here. Thank it's you. amazing to see. It is heating up. It sure is, isn't it? Beautiful. <laughs> nah, it is glorious, but I'm so excited about what we're going to be doing with this. Well, look, most people, when they use botanicals or herbs, they tend to put them in savoury food. Yeah. But it's not the only thing you can do. You can make cakes as well, which really? is exactly what I've got in mind. Hard work okay. for you. Okay. No, 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 tell me what you want me to do. So we've got bay, rosemary yeah. and lemon myrtle. Okay. Eight bay leaves are going to go into the blender here, yeah. along with the leaves from six sprigs of rosemary and about 18 lemon myrtle. So I take it you're going to grind that up? 
Absolutely. But, yeah, you need a little bit of sugar, don't you? Okay. Uh, two cups worth, which Ooh. is about half the pack. A little bit. Um, if you put it in, yeah, it's only a little bit. <laughs> put it in your blender and you want to put it on like a medium speed, and you'll end up with this lovely fine green powder. Well, let's have a look at this. Oh, you can see the colour. Look at that. And the oh, aroma. Oh, it's outstanding. It's good, outstanding. isn't it? And you're obviously not too worried. There's still a couple of little leaves in there, but that'll come yeah, out. Yeah, you'll chill those, won't you? <laughs> no, we'll sip them. <laughs> Once we've got the last of the sugar passed through, what we're going to do is throw in the rest of our dry ingredients. Do you want to open up the flour? Yep. We need about 300 grams worth, which is you know, just shy of a third of a pack. In addition to that, we'll throw in some baking powder, a little bit of salt, and a packet of almond meal. That's 150 grams. So into a separate bowl or into that? Well, straight in, yeah. yeah no, it's, I trust you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Keep your distance. Keep your distance, buddy. <laughs> Beautiful. All right. Try ingredients, now, done. Indeed, indeed. Now, we all know that Joe is a professional stirrer, so <laughs> your job. Uh, touché, young man, touché. <laughs> oh, I can't even hold a bowl! <laughs> hey, fumble fingers, I wish you were holding this right now. <laughs> <laughs> wipe this out. <laughs> that was karma at that its That really finest. was, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Look, as far as your wet ingredients are concerned, what you're going to need uh, in this bowl is three whole eggs and three egg yolks. One of the whites, set it aside because you will need that later on. And then you're also going to pop in a cup of buttermilk, a cup of extra virgin olive oil. That looks pretty good. And a little splash of rose water. So, Ed, with all this sugar, this is going to be quite sweet. Is it going to be sickly sweet or...? Oh, I don't know. Not sickly, but yes, it's definitely okay. sweet. But actually, you've made a really good point, and you should all think about that next time you're baking. Sometimes you need to add a little bit of acidity, like in the form of a bit of lemon juice, and uh, that'll so help to balance things through. out. Yeah. yeah, it really does. It really does. So I'll throw some of that in. You can use lime, pink grapefruit, anything you like. Um, and then we'll stir it together and pop it in the cake tin, and that's the, the cake done. Tell you what, that is so ridiculously easy. And you notice we've put the dry ingredients one spoon at a time into the wet ingredients. Because it's, you know, you can see quite a wet batter, that's going to make sure you end up with no lumps. Just a matter of pouring it in. Uh, and as for baking it, 175, 180 degrees, thereabouts, it's going to take somewhere between 40 and 45 minutes just until a skewer can be popped in. Alrighty, let's get it in. That's a thing of beauty. He reckoned that a little splash of gin over the top wouldn't be a bad idea. And I think, given we're here... Now, there's one more thing I do want to put onto our cake to make it really seriously pretty, and that's a really simple icing. So, yeah. what you've got there is just some icing sugar, a little bit of egg white, not too much, and a little more of our rose water. Give it a bit of a whisk together. You only need a tiny bit. A little bit and of that. And then we'll drizzle it over the top. Wow. The important thing here is don't overdo it, and that is something I struggle with. <laughs> oh, but it looks so pretty. One last thing. When we were at Grey Springs Farm, yep. I did pick some fresh flowers in the field. They're all edible and they're right there for you, so you can do a little bit of decorating Aww. while this drizzles down. Gorgeous. A cake this spectacular you can knock up at home with about 10 minutes' work. How do you know that? If we can do it in a garden, you can do it in the kitchen. Absolutely. Yeah.